kind of echoing here today. Is it? And it's 10 o'clock. So that's all right. Confusing in the mind. So um, you will all notice that Steve is attending online and he is in Hines, Illinois. Um, and he will be visible and we will be able to hear him throughout the whole meeting. And with that, I'll call the meeting to order. And if you'd like to rise for the pledge. Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there anybody here who would like to speak at the public forum? Okay, come on up. You've got three minutes. Thank you. Mike McCullen from Wilma Township. I'm on the town board there. We also have Jeff Shute and Jason, what's your name? Call me. They're from uh, Danforth, the township right next to Crooked Lake there. And what we came for is about the access into Crooked Lake where we were, we understood that there was going to be more of a, a parking lot there is the way it sounded. But talking to Matt before the meeting, it sounds like it's going to be a widening of the road and just a trail into there. We just were afraid of too much traffic and people camping back there and throwing garbage and all the problems that can come with that. And uh, it sounds like it's not going to happen, but we want you. We want to let you guys know that the township officers and the people that we represent that we've spoke with don't want a, a big formal thing in there. Maybe a little widen of the road so they can pull off the side a little easier, but that's about all. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much, Mike. Is there anybody else who would like to speak at the public forum? Oh. I got a little concern. My name is Jason Palm with Danforth Township. Um, just a little concern on the not being a wetland. I've, I mean, I've applied for wetland permits before and I've gotten maps that classify it as a class six wetland in there, which I know isn't the lowest wetland. But um, so when they say that it's not a wetland, I am, I'm concerned that it's of that comment, I guess. Otherwise, as a township officer, that road isn't super wide maintained. So, I mean, I'd like to see if the county's going to be bringing more traffic back in there and, and encouraging parking on the road, that there'd be enough room to safely park on the road and not impede traffic. If somebody's hauling a four-wheeler trailer in there, they got to kind of drive off the road and down to the ditch and, I mean, those, those things. And I know it's the township's responsibility to maintain the road, and we have put in a significant portion of our budget into improving that road. Just limited funding has led us to where we are. Again, I, I, can, I, can I make some comments? Yes. Because yes. since these guys were at the meeting, the zoning board met last week. And this came back before the zoning board. And the zoning board decided that against the parking lot, how it all not. Yeah. So, and and they, the, the resolution was they're just going to gravel the, where the ruts are, yeah. widen the road to make the shoulder. And, and the DNR was there. There is no wetland has to play. SWCD will out there and looked at it. There's no wetland in play. They're only going to do that on the high ground. On that high high ground, it's not a, it's not a wetland. There's casual water sometimes in the ditch and stuff there. But where they're where they're going to do the graveling and stuff, there's no wetlands in play at all. Oh, so if that helps, the, but the zoning board that was a matter of record in front of that in front of them, and they and they had all those questions from the original approach, the same ones you were raising, yep. and it was resolved at that, and they put stipulations in how it's going to happen. Well, and they originally were going to put that parking lot in there, and I asked them if they were going to maintain that in the winter time for ice fishermen. So my same, and they said no. Yeah. So yep. my original question again of parking on the road comes back. Yep, and it's going to be widened in. The whole the whole road will be widened in that area, so so people can park on the side of the road. Oh, see, that's not the impression I got from that meeting. No, that's what's going to happen. Oh, okay. that's the resolution. Oh, I had a question. Mm -hmm. And you you said you actually applied for in the past for yourself for wetland for building in a wetland. You were turned down. You were. I was just cleaning out an existing yeah. ditch. Oh, this so is, were... is what my permit was for, which is completely unrelated oh, to okay. this. But that's where I got. Yeah, how long did it, did it take a while to get that permit? Did it take a long time? No, it was a pretty good, pretty, pretty, pretty easy process. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else who would like to speak for public forum? All right, we will move on then. We need 
to adopt the agenda. We have some additions and oh, Madam Chair, members of the board, if we could add consent agenda item 2C award contract number 2401. Uh, this is a federal project for work on County State 8 Highway 61 from Trunk Highway 18 to the Kettle River uh, and award that to KGM contractors. And if we could add consent agenda item number five, resolution 24-36. This is uh, rescinding resolution 2024-31 uh, regarding a gambling permit for the Surgeon Lake Lions to give them more flexibility uh, based on their request uh, to the auditor. And then if we could add regular agenda item number 6.1, uh, Commissioner Waldham has requested a discussion of the U.S. Supreme uh, Court decision in Tyler versus Hennepin County. I'll move as amended, Madam Chair. Thanks, Matt. I'll second. Thanks, JJ. We got a motion by Matt, a second by JJ. Are there any questions? Yeah, on the, uh, oh, go ahead, Matt. Oh, no. Let's get them time. Oh, yeah. On the Sturgeon Lake Lions and the fishing um, contest, they're currently working on it now to see if the DNR would change your schedule. Um, talking to uh, the township was never notified that they were going to be shutting this down. Citizens weren't notified. The DNR had just come in and cut down trees along the shoreline of Sturgeon Lake and posted it. Uh, currently, the Sheriff's Department put on social media this morning that it's going to be closed. Um, Representative Dotseth is working with St. Paul right now to see if possibly a couple of things, you know, why they're doing it. Like I said, uh, Windermere Township wasn't even wasn't even notified of this. Uh, and then if it, if they have to actually do all this work, if it can be postponed to, uh, you know, the end of the season, um, this has been a 44 year fishing contest by the Lions. They've already advertised it's posted. They've put flyers around the County and it's just not going to work. Um, there's other potential ways to launch a boat on that lake. Everybody understands, but it's it's not safe for the amount of people they're talking about, the amount of boats that actually show up for this 44th, 44th annual event. Yeah. And ahead, Madam Chair, if I may, Kelly Shorter, County Auditor Treasurer. So in relation to the gambling permit, um, in talking with Jim with the Sturgeon Lake Lions yesterday, yes, there is a question. Maybe they'll be able to still do it on their original date, or maybe they won't. And so that's the purpose of the resolution. It's just to give them that flexibility to be able to do it on one day or the other. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, and that would be that. Would there have to be then a like a special meeting in our part, or how would we change so the date or grant it? License is make... granting either one of those dates, so it's it's okay. opening it up so that they have room to move. Yeah, cause so that we don't have to call a special meeting because the time is very short with the state um, gambling control board. So this just allows them to do what they need to do, the Lions. So no matter what, the show will go on. Right. From our standpoint. Um, Good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Can you please do a roll call, Jess? Uh, District 1, Commissioner Holland. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Lovegren. District 4, Commissioner Waltham. Yes. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. We're going to move on to approve the minutes and the summary for publication from the June 18th board meeting. I'll move. Oops. I'll okay. second. Helen. We got Josh and Matt. Helen. Oh, he said Josh and Steve. Okay. <laughs> so are there any questions on the on the minutes? Can you do a motion, please, or a uh, call, please, Jess? District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Lovegren. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Waltham. Yes. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Commissioner Holland. Yes. Next, we have the minutes of the boards. We have the Pine County Surveyor's Report for June, the unapproved zoning board minutes from May of 2024, and the unapproved HRA EDA board minutes. All of those, Madam Chair. Thanks, Matt. I'll second. Thanks, Josh. We got a motion by Matt, a second by Josh. Are there any questions on any of those reports? All right, can we do a roll call again, please, Jessica? Yes. District three, Commissioner Lovegren. Aye. District four, Commissioner Waldham. Yes. District five, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District one, Commissioner Holland. Yes. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. Then we're gonna approve the amended consent items. Are there any questions on any of those? Can I can we have a motion to approve them, please? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Steve. 
I'll second. Thanks, Josh. By Steve, second by Josh. Are there any questions on the consent agenda? I I do have one. Okay. Um, just a real quick question. Do you know how many um, contracts with townships we have out there with uh, oh, law enforcement? Do you know, Jeff? Off the top of my head, I don't have the exact number. Okay. It, is it getting quite a few or is it? Yes, we, we've increased those. Uh, we haven't seen an increased use in them. Okay. It, it's very limited use in those contracts and it's, we prescribe it as needed. So they would call and ask us and then we would have to enforce um and ordinance okay uh, but we do have the options out there with more and more of them but again use hasn't really gone and that's kind of just to have it in case you need type of deal right and, and, if, and they, if they come up to a, a stalemate on uh something whether they're trying to get the ordinance into compliance or person in compliance with the ordinance um that gives us a law enforcement option to yeah. good because I have noticed more and more of them come up and that's for local. with the county attorney as well on stuff too. So. Right. And Madam Chair and Sheriff Nelson, just to maybe describe a little bit, we have contracts where the sheriff's office does regular policing, uh, like with the city of Pine City. And those are like four or five. And then there's a number of these that it's just as is. Yeah. And it just makes it easier for the sheriff's office to respond uh, to those townships or small cities. Perfect. I just like seeing the partnership and, and that I appreciate it. So are there any other questions? Roll we'll call, please. District four, Commissioner Waltham. Yes. District five, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District one, Commissioner Holland. Yes. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District three, Commissioner Lovegren. Aye. We're on to the regular agenda. We've got the Lakeside Center Tax Abatement Public Hearing. So we're going to have the presentation by Leslie. Good morning. I'm Leslie Sauter, your economic development coordinator. I'm just going to kind of give a brief overview of what this project entails, um, just to kind of bring you guys up to speed or refresh your memory. Um, I was here in April and gave a presentation on this project. Um, but now is the date to do the public hearing and, and the formal adoption of it. So this is a tax abatement crest for Lakeside Center. It was formerly a nursing home as well as some clinic services and is being repurposed into student housing as well as a recreation center for Pine Technical Community College students that are reliving there and an expansion of an existing childcare in Pine City. So there's some history with this building. As I mentioned, it was a nursing home. It closed in April of 2022. It was listed by August. And there were a couple different potential purchases, um, but it has very complicated shoreland zoning. It's a large building. It takes up a lot of um, space on a parcel. So there, there's this impervious surfaces. There's existing parking lots that are close to the shoreline. It just makes it very hard to repurpose it. Um, however, the Pine City Planning Commission did approve student housing there and the property sold in August of 2023. So it turned around in almost a year. Um, and the current owner, the developer, has been granted temporary occupancy um, to use some of the, the housing units as the rest of the building gets uh, renovated. So I believe like one floor is, is almost fully renovated, but to move on to the next floor, as well as the entire rec center and the child care center is going to take a bit more money and a bit more time. Um, ironically, we also partnered with Pine Technical Community College for the child care expansion um, in a portion of this building. So we did get that award uh, notification in May. So there is, it's, it's a complicated, but also really neat community project that is addressing a lot of needs. Um, but today we're here with the tax abatement request and what that means. So here's the overview of the property from the sky. You can kind of see it's a large building on a parcel on Cross Lake in the city of Pine City. Um, it actually has two addresses and it's two different parcels, but for this purpose, it's it's being treated as one and they're kind of broken down in the financials separately. But overall, the combined value of these two parcels is just under $2 million. Um, the estimated value of once it is completely redeveloped will be close to $7 million. Um, key notes about this property is something this size and of this construction can deteriorate pretty quickly when it's vacant. So moving quickly and getting it repurposed is in the best interest of the past 
owner as well as the current owner and the community because as we know vacant buildings can sometimes attract vandalism and all sorts of fun stuff uh it's uh located on cross lake in pine city so as i mentioned earlier the shoreland zoning makes it really complicated to redevelop into different ideas um, Pine City has, as well as the entire county, identified a, a strong housing need. So repurposing this into housing um, meets that community need, as well as helps the college with their expansion and attracting students. So it's a win-win there. Here is just a, an example of what one of the rooms repurposed into student housing looks like um, and what the total development cost is for just the housing component there. And then here's just kind of a preview of what the rec center, uh, where the recreate or kind of like community space for the residents of this facility will be able to hang out as well as students at the, the college. And then where the old Fairview clinic was in that building is where the child care center is getting repurposed. And I tried to replicate a really neat graph that Kelly made for our last tax abatement request, but I couldn't get it to go up over all of the years. But this just gives a good example of what the current taxes are on the property. They're around $50,000 a year. And so that will still be coming into the city and county as they pay their property taxes. The part that you are abating is what that increase would be. So it goes from being valued at about $2 million to being valued at $7 million. So therefore, you pay more property taxes on a $7 million property versus a $2 million property. That increase is what's being abated over 15 years and put back into the project to make it cash flow better. So that's trying to show that graphic and we do get to retain some of that for administering the funds and handling the extra paperwork. What does the five-year look back? The five-year look back is Ellers has proposed that as part of the term because they want to look back in five years to make sure that the project is performing the way the projections okay. um, outlined because they are just projections. So they're your best guess on how the project's going to go. Um, if it's doing better than what was projected, then it, it, the abatement could fall off. If it's not, then we kind of keep on keeping on. Okay, thank you. you bet. So that's my very brief presentation on what this is. Um, we do have Todd from Ellers here to answer any technical questions because this is this is my high level view of tax abatement and how I can explain it to people. He's got the technicality stuff down pat um, and Fred Stelter, the uh, developer is also here to answer any questions about the project should you have them, so. Madam Chair. Yes, Steve. Uh, Leslie, uh, essentially nothing has changed since this was presented a couple of months ago. Correct. Nothing has okay. changed since April. Yep. Are there any other um, questions or discussion on this? I am so excited that they're putting this building to use and to be able to bring in more, more youth, more adults into Pine Technical College and the daycare and the... Um, so to the developer, thank you for planning this all out and making it such a, what an opportunity for Pine City. Just really appreciate you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so now we're gonna open it up to the public. Anybody want to give any public testimonies or discussion? Please, one more time, anybody? Seeing none, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Is there any? One more time, any conversation or discussion on this side? So we need to consider Pine County Resolution 2024-35, approving the tax property or the property tax abatement and authorizing the tax abatement agreement. So it's for both of those. Can we have a motion for Resolution 2024-35? I'll move uh, Resolution 2024-35. Thank you, Josh. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. second that. Go ahead. So we get Josh and we have Steve. Steve. Once again, are there any questions or discussion on this? If not, we do a roll call, please, Jess. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Commissioner Holland. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Lovegren. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wilhelm. Yes. That's exciting. Thank you. We're going to go on to the Midwest. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Midwest Medical Examiner's Office Annual Report. You arrived in the nick of time. <laughs> I 
was listening outside to make sure I made a grand entrance. <laughs> Good job. Good Thank job. You. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Everyone is doing well. Um, I'm Dr. Piper. Uh, each year I come and present a summary of the deaths that occurred in Pine County uh, for the preceding year. So this will be for 2023. Um, I have a, a summary of um, uh, a few different things. And if anybody has any specific questions at the end, that would be great. Um, just an update, our office is now the appointed medical examiner for 37 uh, counties in Minnesota, uh, and we also serve over 10 counties in Wisconsin. Um, for 2023, um, there were a total of 234 deaths in Pine County, and of those, 218 were reported to the medical examiner's office. Uh, our office assumed jurisdiction or was responsible for the death certificate in 41 um, of those cases. Uh, of those, um, about 10 required just a medical record review. Um, um, and we did um, about 30 um, autopsies. For the manner of death, um, the report says that there were two homicides. One death was classified as homicide, but it was an event that had occurred um, previously and didn't even occur in Pine County. Um, but the person died um, of injuries sustained. So that would be uh, part of our statistics. So uh, technically there was one um, homicide death um, last year of a 94 year old man. And there were 19 deaths classified as accident. Uh, 13 natural. Uh, there were six deaths due to suicide. Four of those were due to gunshot wounds and their ages ranged from four, 30 uh, to 49 years. For the accidental deaths, 13 were classified as due to drugs or substance abuse. Uh, and those people ranged in age from 23 to 67 years. Um, there was a very rare incident of an accidental gunshot wound and that with a three-year-old child. Of the toxicology deaths, uh, sorry, I'm not going in the same order as the office made me. Um, <laughs> so of the 13 deaths due to drug abuse, fentanyl was present in nine uh, of those decedents. And the number in parentheses is the total incidence of fentanyl that our office saw with all of the deaths we investigated. So we saw 240 incidents of fentanyl, nine of those were pine. Uh, methamphetamine was present in 11 uh, of the 13 decedents, um, and we did not see any cocaine, heroin, or xylazine. Um, On to the blunt force injuries slide. Two of those were due to a motor vehicle crash, um, and two were due to injuries sustained in falls. Um, for the accident subclassification, a very um, odd little um, up and down for the substance abuse. I don't have 2019 on the graph, but I looked up the data. In 2019, um, our office had um, four deaths due to drug abuse. In 2020, there was 15. You can see in 2021, there were 12, and then a crash down to three, um, and then we're, we're back up um, at uh, 13. Um, and then we have a manner of death um, by year, as you can see there. Um, and again, the accidents in 2021, there were more motor vehicles and there were more um, deaths due to substance use um, in, that, in that year. Um, so that uh, is the summary very quickly. But if anyone has any questions for me. No question. Yep. Go ahead, TG. On your... Uh... You said on, on uh, suicides, four were gunshot wounds. Yes. What were the other two then? Um, probably hangings. I didn't look at that, but hanging is usually the second most common. Um, I didn't specifically look at those. I usually just look for the, people are always seem to be concerned about the, the oh. gunshot, but yeah. But in general, for most of our counties, hangings are either the close second or in very rare cases, they, they're the majority. Then you had another gun, accidental gunshot. On the, it was a three-year-old child who had a parents. You, you track more than just gunshots then, right? You track everything. Four accidental. For, oh, for both. Yeah. Yes. 
Okay. Yes. All right. Not just gunshot. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Are there any other questions? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Steve. I, if I could, um, I missed the the youngest. Got what? What I'm getting at was there any babies that were that died because their parents were using fentanyl when they were born? You know. We don't we don't have anything to to track that. We don't have the deaths of any young children that occurred at least in Pine County where a parent was was using that I'm aware of. The youngest um, person who our office investigated who died was three, and that was the gunshot wound. So we didn't okay. have any uh, infant deaths come through our office for Pine last year. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Madam Chair, if I could just make a historical uh, comment. We have been with the Midwest Medical Examiner now for 10 years, started in 2014. And in 2014, we paid $52,000. And in 2015, we paid $55,000. For 2024 and 2025, we are paying $50,000. And so I just wanted to highlight, I think, the excellent effort that Dr. Piper has done in growing the facility in a way that was efficient and keeping costs down for everybody. So I uh, just recognize that. And we are contracted through December 31st, 2025 at this point. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Do you yeah. get the juice on running anything else? <laughs> <laughs> we just do the good work. Our director, Shane Sheets, does all the money part, but yeah, he just puts us to work. We appreciate you coming here and telling us what's, I mean, this is, um, I think we all sit and wonder as to what's really happening. You, you hear things, but what what is the truth? And so I, I appreciate this. Thank you. It's good to see everyone every year. <laughs> I don't know what the that's Steve. That and that. Um, that's Steve. Yeah, it's Steve. He's at a facility in Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you. Yep, thank, you. Everyone. thank you. Thank you. Now we have the Initiative Foundation reports. Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time today. Happy to give a quick update and summary of the Initiative Foundation's activities across the region and here in Pine County. Specifically, I, I hope you have our impact sheet as part of your packet. And so I'll just kind of reference that as we move forward. But of course, as you know, since 1986, the foundation's been working to build healthy communities and thriving economies uh, across the region. We work to be a strong a uh, reliable, consistent resource for the region. And at the same time, uh, we want to build uh, resources and programming to meet some of those long-term needs, challenges that are more long-term in nature. And we work hard to be responsive to emerging needs in our communities as well. So trying to balance both, uh, it's a bit of complicated work and across 14 counties, there's a lot of diversity in terms of our populations and community needs. Uh, but we keep uh, maintain a spectrum of programs and services uh, to meet those needs. And I'll just highlight a few of those here today. Uh, and so I would just reference the your uh, county report and down in the bottom right where it says economic impact, uh, some of those numbers there. And just start with our gap financing program. We maintain a real robust gap financing team working almost exclusively in partnership with financial institutions to provide that financing for projects that uh, a lot of times they wouldn't move forward if we weren't able to get involved and be a partner. Not always, but we're happy to come in and fill some of those gaps. And we deploy those resources to support business purchases or business successions, expansions, all sorts of different needs. And you can see down there in the bottom right, uh, the number of loans. This is since 1986. 46 loans in Pine County, two and a half million in lending, and those projects leveraged 18, uh, $11.8 million in outside capital. Um, and then more recently here in Pine County in the last three years, three loans, 280,000 in gap financing, uh, creating or retaining 20 jobs. Um, and I always just encourage everyone to uh, remember to remind your local lenders and financial institutions, we're a great partner. We'd love to get involved. Uh, we generally uh, try to work, like I say, in partnership with our financial institutions. So if they've got a project and they're looking for a gap, reach out to our team. They're always happy to explore whether anything's uh, a good fit. 
Uh, complementary to that gap financing program are, are all the programs and services that we provide to support entrepreneurs and business owners in the region. A lot of training, technical assistance, coaching for business owners, and especially entrepreneurs across the region. Continue partnering with DEED to deliver some of their grants and programs across the region. Promise Act grants for for-profit businesses, Promise Act loans for profit businesses. Uh, lots of good work there. Um, we continue to expand uh, some of those entrepreneurship programs as well. Uh, we're happy to support uh, a lot of funding that is uh, centered on BIPOC entrepreneurs, but we continue to reach out to some of our more rural communities and support people starting businesses way out, Emily, uh, some of those far reaches out in the region to help those folks get started too. And so then complementary to that support for for-profit businesses is of course our ongoing nonprofit development programming where we're working to build the capacity of our nonprofit organizations and those leaders. Um, really happy to say we've been expanding that programming lately, um, trying to provide training, not just in our headquarters in Little Falls, but out uh, to, in parts of the region to make it more accessible to folks. We've had trainings in North Branch and Princeton to kind of get over on this side. And again, the other side of the region, we've reached out way up north as well. We've had a lot of increased interest in our grant writing programs. We've had as many as 60 and 65 folks show up to do grant writing training, advanced grant writing training, a lot of city administrators and city folks showing up to get that grant writing training. Happy to continue to provide that and to continue to expand the reach and the locations of those trainings to make them more accessible to folks. Um, and again, on the other side of nonprofit development training is our grant making that we provide across the region. We're happy to continue to, to do what we can to award grants to nonprofits, local units of government, uh, et cetera. Um, you can see down in the bottom right hand corners in Pine County, 653 grants, 3.9 million since 1986. Last year, we awarded 12 grants in Pine County, total of $58,000. And you'll see those numbers have dropped off a lot since the COVID days when we had hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars of grants flowing up. But happy to still see those grants being facilitated all over the region. Um, and I think an interesting grant uh, that we've been involved in here, well, one was the support for uh, uh, strategic planning for the county. Another one helped a, a facility in Sandstone explore a geothermal project. I've seen grants for PTO organizations, local school districts, lots of neat projects being supported here uh, in Pine County. And then complementary to our own grant making are the grant making of our charitable funds. We are a regional community foundation. We host about 140 charitable funds. The combined grant making from those donor advised funds, community funds, education funds is about $1.1 million a year. You have three funds that are actually headquartered, so to say, here in Pine County, about six funds that are actively making grants here in Pine County. And again, we're happy to provide those folks with back office support. We keep them compliant with the IRS and we provide lots of training and coaching to their leadership teams and advisory boards, et cetera, for those charitable funds. Um, it's a diverse bit of work, but again, the grant making and leadership development that are kind of go right alongside with those charitable funds is something we're really excited to do. And in the future, looking forward to even more of that great work. Um, alongside that, I'll just continue moving quickly. We continue prioritizing helping communities uh, create solutions for access to affordable child care. Uh, we're gathering stakeholders, linking people to consultants and other experts to help them do strategic plans, find solutions and see if we can find some resources to help those strategic plans and solutions get their next steps. Uh, alongside that, we continue to build our own capacity and develop programming to help communities look for uh, projects that might support a clean energy uh, economy and support in, uh, communities that are, that are in energy transition across the region as well. We're hoping to hear from a funder within the next few days, actually, that would support a staff member at the foundation that would work solely with communities uh, trying to help them develop clean energy projects and ways that we can drive and build economies that are centered on clean energy. So uh, kind of excited about that. Hopefully we'll have good news even just uh, in the next few days.
And so uh, I would just really quick wrap this up by directing our attention back to the middle of the sheet. And you can see we do track the amount we've collected from within a county and the amount we've invested back in to that county. And then right underneath that, a return on investment number there. Um, we're real proud of this work, and uh, we really believe one of the ways we add great value to the region, aside from all the programming and lending and, and work that we do, is to say uh, we're really good at going outside of central Minnesota, capturing resources, pulling them back into central Minnesota, and putting them to work to amplify uh, everyone's investment in us. Uh, so you can see for every dollar we collect in Pine County as a contribution from an individual or a business or a city or county, we return $7.47 back. Happy to multiply those investments many times over. And all that work is made possible through those contributions. They support those teams that go out and gather those resources, state, federal, other uh, foundations, and bring them back into work here. And so I just want to say we appreciate your support, appreciate your contributions, uh, and not only do we appreciate the financial support, but also just your support for the foundation in general. We're, we're happy to be a good partner and glad to have you as partners in our mission and our work right here in Pine County. Um, I know I talk fast. I try to cram it all in and get in and, and get out, but uh, I'd happy to take any questions if anybody has questions for me. How many employees do you have at the initiative foundation? 33 today, maybe 34 tomorrow. If, uh, if we get good news, uh, but about, yeah, 33. The, a good follow-up to that is uh, a, more than half of our staff are grant funded. They're funded by the funding that, you know, we've secured from other locations and about half are funded uh, using general endowment and other loan fund dollars, et cetera. Some of those programs are self-sustaining and others have grant funding. So. Yeah, I don't know if it's a typo or not, but you have it said for every dollar locally, you reinvest an average of four thirty-seven, and then you said seven, seven forty-seven, which is a oh substantially bigger return. Yeah, sorry, my sheet says seven forty-seven, but may I, I apologize. Oh yeah, mine's four thirty. Mine says seven forty-seven return on investment. <laughs> How did I manage to just break yours? I don't know. Seven from a buck even. That's good. <laughs> yeah, well, I definitely need to double check. I I, I think it's closer to seven in in, in Pine this County. Is your June seventh, twenty twenty-four letter. Oh it, yeah. So oh. the letter, the letter says four dollars and thirty-seven cents. Yep. The handout on the page says seven dollars. Right. Forty-seven. Cents. Yep. The letter would have gone out before the sheets were updated, oh, probably. Yeah. So we've got some investment since we printed the letter. Yeah. Yeah. Impressive either way. Turn a buck into that. That's great. Are there any other questions or comments? I just want to thank you. Pine County has utilized the Initiative Foundation, so we've used it for daycare and we've used it for strategic planning is where we got the grant to do our strategic planning. And so the things that you have been given, and, and I, like I said, I worked in the auditor's office during COVID and called all these businesses and said, hey, you need to apply or we need to get you down. Um, you guys have just been so gracious and we appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's good work. We're happy to do it. Looking forward to doing even more in the future. So yep. thank you. Yep. Thanks again. We need a motion. Thank you. Okay. Seems good. Thank you. Good day. Um, Sandstone Drop Off Center, Recycling Drop Off Center. Madam Chair, members of the board, Mike Gaynor, uh, Land and Resources Manager. So, uh, back in 2021, uh, Pine County entered a memorandum of agreement with uh, the City of Sandstone to operate its Central Pine Recycling Center on the former city waste compost site. Uh, the feedback continues to be positive. And the city has consented to extend it for another three years. There's no compensation for the agreement, and either party can exit it with 90 days' notice or a shorter notice of mutual agreement. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? No. Oh. So, do we need to <clears throat> um, have a motion to sign the memorandum of, of a. I, I will move that, Madam Chair, for Thanks, the three year memorandum of agreement. Second. Thanks, JJ. Motion by Matt, second by JJ. Are there any other questions or comments? Can you roll call, please? District 1, Commissioner Holland? Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore? Aye. District 3, Commissioner Lovegren? Aye. District 4, Commissioner Waltham? Yes. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig? Aye. Next on the agenda is a Snake River Watershed Management Board update. Um, as you've all read, we we did do a petition last year to um, 
dissolve the Snake River Watershed Management Board since we have the Snake River Watershed one plan. Um, it's just a duplicate of all services and money, which is not a good way to spend our money. Um, I think we're finally gonna get some movement on this. The board met last Tuesday or was it the Tuesday before? And um, on Monday and talked about the question came up is what do we need to do to move this forward because we know that it's we're, there's no there's nothing on the books there's nothing being brought to this committee it's all going to the one watershed one plan so um they talked to their attorney and they decided that because it was our our letter to dismiss was not approved that we needed to do it again so this is coming to you to ask to send another letter to dissolve that committee the membership committee on snake river watershed and just go to one watershed one i will make that motion thank you so much i'll second thank you so we got a, a motion by matt a second by josh are there any questions on this madam chair just yes. if i could state the motion that it would be to uh approve a petition to the snake river watershed management board to dissolve under section 10 of the joint powers thank you do we have to include the read the distribution back that's part of the that will be part okay the joint powers process. What's in this bylaws? Okay, thank you. If we dissolve it, we'll get the money back. But if when we asked if we withdrew, they would not give us the money back, which is why we didn't withdraw. So, all right. So we got a motion by Matt, a second by Josh. Are there any other questions? What was the feeling that they will? Allow I it? think so. Oh. Um, Kanabic. Kanabic made the motion last year that they wanted to see dirt move, and I think that they're softening on that. Um, Malak's Malacca County um, or Malax County, they said, "What will it take?" And so today, while we're meeting here, Soil and Water from over in Kanabic County is going to go meet with their board to talk about them with what they are doing with the one watershed, one plan. So the the goal is that we'll be able to get this done. And Madam Chair, mm -hmm. uh, Aiken County is likely to consider a similar petition for dissolution on July 9th at their next meeting. Okay. And we both filed, Aiken County and Pine County both filed the petition to dissolve last time together too, so. One other quick question. Uh, has Mille Lacs County joined one watershed now? No. They still haven't, no. but uh, Kanabic has. Yes. Okay. Yep. The uh, money goes back into the general fund if we get it back? Or what is it? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Waldheim. It will go back to the general fund. Any other questions? Roll call, please. District 2, Commissioner Moore? Aye. District 3, Commissioner Lovgren? District 4, Commissioner Wilhelm? Yes. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig? Aye. District 1, Commissioner Holland? Yes. All right, so we are going to move on to discuss cannabis and what our next steps are and direction. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, you have a model ordinance from the uh, Office of Cannabis Management uh, that you can consider. And if you wanted to consider an ordinance, uh, today would be the day to discuss any particular parameters you wanted to include. And then I did talk to uh, County Attorney Fredrickson and he thought that uh, he would have that ready for the August, first meeting in August, if you wanted to have a public hearing on a cannabis ordinance. And so if you wanna, um, run through some of the points in the model ordinance that you might want to discuss or I'm not sure how you want to proceed with the conversation. Well, I want to make a motion that we have a model, what we have a or get started on getting an ordinance. So I, we do have to have a countywide ordinance. So a, a couple of, of points, the model ordinance includes in section three zoning in the model ordinance, I think our recommendation would be that this ordinance not include zoning, that if the county wanted to include any particular zoning requirements, that it be done in the zoning ordinance and each jurisdiction that has their own zoning would do that as well. And so that would be a little bit different than what the model proposes. I would agree with that. And I, the zoning board is already having some discussion on that. So. And then uh, one question after the uh, meeting that we got, uh, input from the cities and townships on the cities requested if it was possible for the county to do the registration without taking over the zoning and we think that might be possible so that they would apply for registration to the county uh similar to like if you have a restaurant you apply to the state for a 
food license, right, to serve food, but you still have to go to your local jurisdiction for the zoning. And so I think Reese thinks that he can suss that out in an ordinance. And so that would be one thing that uh, maybe would be different than the model that you see. Um, and then the other- so Dave, uh, Madam, Madam Chair. Yep. Can I ask David a question? So, so we we could register them, but knowing that one township might have a completely different zoning restriction than the township right across the road, is that correct? Because we wouldn't be the zoning authority. Correct, and I I think we would have a separate agreement for administration with whatever jurisdiction, like say for example, the city of Pine City, if they were interested in that, we would just have some agreement with them that said, here's how we're gonna process applications. We'll do the registration, you do the zoning. <clears throat> that the ordinance would allow that flexibility, but there would, I presume there would have to be something substantive beyond the ordinance to, to reach agreement with, so that it's and, clear. And, and then David, the, the number, um, of facilities that are available. Is that, is that controlled then by the zoning or is that set that, in the registrations? Well, it's, it depends. So that is another question that if you had thoughts on today would be helpful to get into the draft ordinance. The county and any jurisdiction can limit the number of licenses to one to 12,500 people. So the county ordinance could limit it to three uh, registrations. These are retail registrations. So right. and any jurisdiction, city or township could make a choice to fall under that limit of three or adopt their own limit or no limit. Exactly. And I think, Madam Chair, so my takeaway from our, our meeting up in Sandstone was, I think the county should take three because of all the input we're hearing from townships prior to this, that they don't want to get involved. So we could relieve them if, and they don't have to have a, it, a be in the fight really. Yeah. And in any other jurisdiction that wants it there, that's going to be, we're not going to impede that, but yeah. we can give an out to people that don't want. It. So if we say yeah. we'll take three, but then I, I don't know how we are going that, to, how do you handle what, we're I, I don't know how you word that, but I, I think we're on the same page, Matt, where we say we pick three or five or whatever. But if seven townships said we want to also do it and five cities did, we would have 18 in the county, potentially. The, those 18 would probably happen anyway then because we don't have control over those other jurisdictions. Exactly. Each exactly. jurisdiction has that right for... Right. Exactly. So, question, Kelly, it looked like you wanted to come up here, so I'll, I'll let you. So, uh, we handle uh, liquor licenses as they come, correct? We don't limit them. We don't... Nothing. Is right. Well. Oh. Right. There, there are state regulations on them, but yes, um, we handle the liquor license, but only out in the township areas. The cities handle their own. Okay. And that would be similar with this, correct or not? Potentially, but like townships could choose to do their own registration as well. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I, I don't think we would, I don't think we would interfere with that if we take three. We would just be helping the ones that don't want anything to do with it and are against it. Right. Yeah, that's the way I, I think, Matt, your analysis is good in that if the county adopts an ordinance, it doesn't limit any city or township for doing something more if they want to. Right. But it could have the benefit of having them do less yes. if that's what they want. And I, and I think we'll be helping a lot of townships with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just a reminder, though, the registration only applies to a retail. Yeah. So it doesn't. Right. Do and I think the townships are more concerned the ones that are concerned are concerned about the growers not the retailers and the cities are more concerned about the retailers yeah so i i don't know i could i could be persuaded to say 
let's just do the same thing we do for liquor licenses. And if, if uh, 17 establishments come in and say, we sell liquor already, we'd like to sell cannabis. Um, I don't know. If, if you could be persuaded either way, one yeah. option might be to include it in the draft ordinance and either before adoption or after adoption, you can always remove the limit. But if you adopt an ordinance with no limit, you would have a hard time going back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That helps me, David. Yeah. Because there, if, if, you know, a year down the road, you find that there are three and it's, it's working well, whatever that means, and you want more, you just amend the ordinance and say more. Well, yeah. This whole thing is a moving target for us. Right. Nobody has a crystal ball, but. If I was gonna, if I was gonna throw a dart at the wall right now, I would say limit it to five because there are five commissioner districts, and that way we're not excluding one part of the county over another. But then, are you saying one per commissioner district, or are you saying five per county? Well, I'm saying five per county, but I'm. And that's where base, I'm basing it on the fact that we have five commissioner districts. So if somebody wants to put that other language in there, I guess I, I don't I have it. As far as the commissioner districts, though, or as far as having five commissioners, um, the cities and the townships still have their own rights to do what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. we restrict it to three, like Matt had said. I'm going by statutory minimums. Right. Well, really, it'd be two and a half, but and we don't have a half. People still have the right of choice. choice. Or other other jurisdictions still have the right of choice. Yeah, and municipal dispensaries. If any city wants to have an out, a retail outlet, and tribal dispensaries are generally exempt from whatever number uh, limit might be in the ordinance. Yeah, um, that's the way I understood it. There are some statutory limits that you can place on distant minimum distance from daycares, playgrounds, and hours of operation. Those could be in your uh, draft ordinance if you'd like to see those. And then there are e there's an event registration or license that you could have the discretion if you wanted to make that an administrative issuing process or a county board issuing process. I think you have the option to make those event permits, uh, either one of those. I think we need to have the distance from the schools and the daycares and the, the um, treatment centers. And I think we yeah. need to have that in, in yeah. our draft ordinance. What what do we currently do for uh, liquor? For events, they go through the auditor's office to get, so that's what we just did with Sturgeon Lake. Right. So yeah. for events, they come before you on the consent agenda um, for liquor license and gambling. and. Do, so there could be a temporary know. license, you mean? Right. Do they have restrictions uh, as far as a retail uh, far away from daycare schools? There are some, but not nearly this list. Okay. Well, the other thing, I think if we have that in there, it's illegal to, to use cannabis when there's children involved. So if you're going to have an event that's going to have children involved, then we would not want to give that license because it would cause issues. So I, I think having that, then we'd have some rights to say, well, you know, um, this is yeah. the law and we need to make sure that it's followed. So I, I think we should definitely, I will make a motion to pursue an ordinance mm -hmm. at the county level. And I also make a motion to include the county taking three licenses just to help the townships that don't want anything to do with it or any other jurisdiction that doesn't want anything to do with it. Do you want that all in the same motion or do you want two motions? I can do it in two if you want two. I'll do that. It'd be a one. It could be a one. So um, okay. Okay. Because be, we can include it in the ordinance, I think. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll make that motion. Can I have some discussion now? Why don't you second it and then we'll do discussion? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll second it so we can discuss it. Okay. Open so, discussion. So my question is, is what happens when the day you sign up, you have six people standing at the door? That's my question. Right. And that, that's something that Dave and I have discussed of, is that something that you put in the ordinance? Mm -hmm. Is that, so it's really for us to decide, is it the first three that are standing at my counter? Is it 
the first day, if we get five, we put them in a hat and draw them out. What is it? Um, so we can we can decide that. And that's all to come then? Yeah, and I'm, so Attorney Fredrickson will draft something in the in the proposed ordinance that will account for more licenses than there are, or more, excuse more me, more applications for registration than there are registrations available. And then you can review and discuss that and decide you like it or you want something else or you don't want to, yeah. Because a couple of mine are, to, you know, if you have whatever, however many, and then if one drops off, does it go to the next one in line or do you re-up whatever do you have a I think that'll be a discussion we have to have in an application process okay or does everybody have to reapply type of deal and that's because I can see that being a nightmare for you guys if if it's your discretion somebody wants to open a business and it's like well I'm gonna pick you but not you I don't think that's fair for you guys to make that decision either um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure or just to join your discussion so I'm just saying that they might be in a township that allows it and see so it would be moot so what i'm trying to do by grab that minimum is there's townships that don't want to have it so we can help them and then if it's there's a lots of townships that might they can ask their township and if they support it we wouldn't get in the way because okay, we, we don't right we're not going to regulate a township as its own government unit if they decide to have it they they can have it i think as far as selling a lot of them are going to be in city limits and then the cities can decide that they want to have five in their city or whatever because they have their own, you know, we don't have jurisdiction over the cities mm -hmm. either. So that, that's one correct. Other, one other discussion. If if a township doesn't want it, they can simply say they don't want it, right? They can't. You, you, you can't outright prohibit. They could limit it to per 12,500. Which is or, not ours had. Or they could hope that the county limits it to three and those three are used by others and then they would not have to have any in that right. township right. Or, or city it isn't going to stop growth it's just going to stop people that don't want to by us grabbing the three yeah. the thing i don't do we have the right to grab those three and say they're ours and dispense them that's why i wasn't sure if, you know does it do we have that right well you, you i suppose we do because the county like, anybody else could grab one yeah the county would issue them irrespective of where in the county it would go, right? It could be Pine City, it could be Hinkley, it could be, um, you know, Sturgeon Lake, wherever the that applicant wanted to locate. Mm -hmm. I don't believe, but I think we'll do some follow-up based on uh, Steve's question or idea about the, oh, yeah. the commissioner districts, whether we can add a geographic parameter to it, but I would be surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good with it. That so way. here's just another scenario because I'm good at it. Uh, <laughs> township i'm going to pick royalton because they're here doesn't want a retail establishment in their township we limit it to three the first three that come to the to the table to the county are royalton township we still can't stop it so so, so the most if a jurisdiction wanted to decrease you know make it least likely that they would have multiples they should adopt a similar limit one per 12,500 because then at least they wouldn't have an opportunity for more than one okay and we couldn't say Pakegma Township doesn't mind it so we're going to skip you first three and take the next three that are from Pakegma so that's where I'm like I I really I don't know it's a moving target. And this is all like for discussion just because I'm just thinking of what else comes to play. And if we limit it to three and we decide we want to move up, we can easily, but you can't go down, I see. I think the thing that makes it hard is that we can say three for the county, but that's just the county. Mm -hmm. Each township and city can make their own. And so you, we may end up with, you know, a hundred of them, mm -hmm. and, you know, but the county we're saying, okay, three. And exactly. like Matt said, it's to protect the townships that don't, you know, a lot of our townships don't have the resources to make all the ordinances and to follow, you know, do all of this stuff that needs to be done. That would be beneficial to them to help them to be able to say, nope, it's already done. And as I understand the ordinance, will draft it so that if a jurisdiction has opted into county zoning that we will make it as easy for them to not have to do anything 
that was my next question because the resources that townships don't have, we hear this all the time and they want us to help them. We have a perfect way of helping them with zoning. Right. With, and yeah. this will be just the next layer of uh, would help yeah. all these townships that complain to us that, that we don't have the resources, that we can't deal with this, opt into the zoning and it's done. Correct. Yeah. And I, I got some feedback. I think it was from Park Township after that uh, meeting. And they asked if we could develop a delegation form uh, because that is an option under the, the ordinance or the statute. And so I think that will be part of our to do list so that if you are in county zoning already, it make it as easy as possible if they want to opt in. Mm -hmm. Or dele I guess the, the term is delegate. And uh, not to get too far away from the cannabis discussion, but I am going to plug the zoning a little bit more. Any of the, the zoning that the county does is fully in cooperation with the township. So it's still whatever zoning they want, essentially, but it's it's the county is going to manage it type of deal. So Right. So we have a menu of, I think, nine different zoning districts. So if a township or city wants to opt into county zoning, they get to draw their map of how they want it to be zoned. Yeah. Um, it's not that all of a sudden they get to make something new up. We're happy to work with them cooperatively if it's going to work for all of the townships. Um, but it's kind of a menu that we have set up that they get to pick and choose from. Which is what, and we have been making some um, uh and I've seen some addendums or whatever to, to some zoning come up already right. at the county. So. Yeah, I think we're up to seven jurisdictions that have opted into county zoning. And I think the biggest fear is townships are worried that we're just going to make them do whatever. And no, this is yeah. a whole cooperation and collaboration with them. So that's where, yeah. Okay. Sorry to plug your zoning a little You bit mentioned that, like, I heard the word menu here. So I guess what I'm thinking of, if you have a township that is doing everything on their own right now and they don't want to give that up um if this is the only thing that they don't want to do do they have to give up everything right in order our our goal is not to have to have it as an option of you know do you want to do zoning and registration do you only want to do registration what do you want to do so they would have to give up all their no no they could nope. just do this one right item. They right just because pick. we can do the registration and not do the zoning okay do we currently do that with everything else like if they just wanted to give up parking dogs well, or whatever i mean Sorry. yeah if they want a liquor license that we issue those we just issued one today yeah, I I guess what I'm saying is you have some townships out there that handle all their zoning and handle everything. Right. If they do not want to do this, do they have to give everything to the county or can they just let the county handle this? They can let the county handle the registration piece, yes. Um, I know that Mike and I and Dave had a conversation about would be we be willing to do just the cannabis zoning only? And in my mind, that gets really hard. Um, because we already have very complicated zoning in Pine County. There's, if we have this horrible chart of who you have to go to for permits and it would be another line on the on there of, I have to go here for this, here for this, and here for this. Um, so the zoning piece to me, it would be if, if you want to do your own zoning, then you would be doing your cannabis zoning as well. But if you don't want to do your zoning, then you can do the county zoning. But the registration piece is separate from that for the retail we could do that and not do the zoning and did that make sense i don't think so used. <laughs> can they just keep all their zoning and keep everything they want that they're managing just fine and just come in and say we're not going to deal with this we're just going to pass when, when you it. say this well, i think the, that's the crux of what it, well what we're trying to figure out here i mean i see a model right now from the uh so I, you're attacking the ordinance. I, I would say no. So they, they, have because up, they have to give up all their local control if, if they want to give up this. If they have zoning, yeah. our intent would be that we would present an ordinance that would allow, that you could adopt, that would allow them to maintain their zoning, but give up the registration. And that, in my mind, works like a liquor license, right? Where you issue the license, but you don't 
the county doesn't care anything about the zoning. If the city or town has zone or the town has zoning, that's between them and the applicant. Okay. That allows that split you're discussing then? Yeah. Yeah. And where where I think it gets convoluted is if they don't have any zoning, we presumably could still do registration, but then there just would be no zoning. And I don't I think that would be fine too. But if they have county zoning or opt into county zoning, it's seamless. Like they 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 have to do nothing different. It's their choice. Yeah. Right. It is their I choice. Would, and I would see that there would have to be some sort of an agreement with each jurisdiction that would lay out, and it would be the same agreement, right? But it would lay out, this is what we do as part of the registration. Because they'll come, they'll apply in Kelly's office. Kelly will get it. She'll have to make some kind of a notification to the city or the town. And then they have a timeline that they have to adhere to um, to do whatever it is they may want to do under their zoning ordinance. And if they don't meet that, I think, you know, it's so sad, too bad, because there's timelines in the ordinance or in the statute. And that's where we would just want to be sure it's clear between what is the county registration do and what is the jurisdiction doing on their own. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. which gets me back into part of most of my phone calls are people that call me up that say, well, the township allowed it, but the county doesn't, or the county allowed it, but the township doesn't. And uh, why, when I go across the street, it's different rules than when I'm on this side of the river versus this side of the lake versus this side of the road. Um, this is ridiculous. I can't get a hold of anybody. I've called them multiple times over two weeks and nobody's there where, like I said, it it's, it's, we want some sort of development. We want some sort of uh, uh, uniformity across the county. Um, I have just in my district, I'm sure Matt and JJ and Terry and Steve, um, that they're way different uh, just within your district. And uh, um, it just, it it's hard for people that actually want to come to our county, build a house, um, but build a cabin, start a business or anything to that effect to have some uniformity and or who do I call? I've I've called part of um, townships in my district have never got a, a call back. And every time anybody calls me, I fire them to your, your office. I said, call Kelly or call Mike um, and they will try to steer you because these people are here five days a week, certain hours. And it just, it's as a business owner doing business, you have to you have to be able to do it. And sorry for my plug, but yeah. that's where I'm at. I, I, I agree that it can be a pain, but you also have to realize townships have a right to govern themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, so. mm -hmm. And if they, they have the choice. Which is why we have not imposed zoning on the counties, which we could. And, the, and townships would still have the right, even if we imposed county zoning, to do their own as long as they're at least as strict. And I know what's going to happen is townships that don't do nothing are going to come to us in a year from now and say, you need to help us out because we don't have the resources, because we don't have the people. And then we will we'll do it. It's, it save a lot of problems. I'll get Any off my soapbox. <laughs> I have a motion by Matt and a second by Steve to pursue the ordinance and to put a three- a, a limit of three retail facilities in that ordinance. There's, if I can, there's other things. Uh, what So we will still be making decisions on, I'm going off of this, uh, what was here, like template given by the Office of Cannabis Management in our handle. Because there's even discussions of hours, limiting, limiting the hours of operation, limiting even signage. Um, so we're not setting anything in stone That'll right now. In the ordinance. That'll all be worked out later, right? Yeah, I'd imagine we have to follow the state on the thousand feet rules, five hundred foot rules. Yep, that statute. That's that is so signage. Is the statute also in hours? Hours I know it varies in different areas for things. I think that would be in my mind, those are more zoning type things, probably. There are limits on hours of operation for retail that are in statute right. and those might want to be considered for the ordinance just for clarity um, i think the most the, the more that we can put in there 
the better off we're going to be because then we'll have some grounds to stay in then. And and I, I after today's conversation, I'm I'm confident that Reese can follow up, draft an ordinance for you to consider and have a public hearing August sixth, and then you can modify that as as much as you think necessary mm -hmm. and take as much more time as you you feel you want. Gosh, I, I think. If I could just say something, Madam Chair, Go ahead. just because we have a public hearing on August 6th doesn't mean we have to act on that, uh, what we learn on August 6th. We, we, can, we can give ourselves 60 days, whatever, however, to, to mull it over and ask more questions and make modifications based on on what we came out of that public hearing. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, much like the, what was the last thing you gave me, the Shoreland deal or it went back for a couple months or a month or something like that. And then right. Or six months or. Or a year. <laughs> or a year. Yeah. But yeah, this isn't, this isn't the ordinance. We're just going to give them some direction to draft it. Yeah. Because I, I think it's easier for all of us to look at something and say, oh, I really don't agree with that. And we change it to this. All right, so we have a motion <laughs> to pursue the ordinance with a limit of three retail facilities that are within our right to. Any other discussion? All right, Commissioner. District three, Commissioner Lovegren. District four, Commissioner Waldham. Yes. District five, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District one, Commissioner Holland. Yes. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. Thank you. We're done that one. Um, next is um, discussion on Tyler versus Hennepin. Did you want to go with this one, JJ? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. I know we've briefly talked about it before, and I just wanted I had a discussion with email with Kelly. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody had a copy of this when uh, if anything further comes along. Um, this whole decision, the Tyler versus Hennepin County, was over a $25,000 tax debt. And then I recently found out, and I've been emailing with Kelly, that there was actually a uh, $235,000 tax debt in our county where somebody had actually lost their land forfeited and then the county had sold it and the remainder was $235,000. Um, this whole thing went to the United States Supreme Court and they ruled unanimously that Hennepin couldn't keep the $25,000. Uh, this is substantially larger and the person that lost this money um, wants you know wants an answer i just figured there's probably going to be some more discussion coming i i questioned uh and asked about you know any possible statute of limitations like usually with anything else there's a there's a time frame and and i believe um kelly you said it still isn't decided yet like on the state level of, of when these exact dates are going to happen because if you remove the name tyler versus hennepin county and inserted this person's last name versus Pine County, I believe the same result would happen and this person would be duly compensated. So now... So the legislature this year did pass a settlement bill um, to address these situations and there are hard deadlines in that. Um, so any property that's forfeited since June 23rd of 2016 will be eligible for the state settlement fund. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody had on the board had the opportunity to see this and read it. And then it just actually works into, I had constituents concerned of monies being spent like just now on Crooked Lake, because it says on the end of Crooked Lake that the land department tax forfeit land sales is funding that. So questions that I'm fielding is if it's undecided yet, when this money is going to be dispersed or paid back to people, why are we, why is the county spending right now instead of just putting the brakes on and holding and waiting to see 
Because just so there's no shortcoming. Yeah. So the settlement only like for our dollars, the settlement only looks at any sales that we have on those qualifying properties after January 1st of 2024. So properties that have forfeited since June 23rd of 2026, if we sell them right now, 75% of those properties. But anything we did before January 1st of 2024 is under the old statutes, under the old non-existent settlement but the settlement has clear dates and clear requirements that we follow and if 75 percent goes back what where's the other 25 percent go then the county can re retains that other 25 percent for our administrative costs and things still putting it into parks and recreation um it was split up into three things right or potentially parks. Um, the settlement language is very clear about that going to the county general fund. And so those are not county general funds. So there is some questions that are still kind of out there about what happens with that 25%, at least that I have. Um, I think attorneys are probably very clear on where, you know, how that money will flow, that retain 25%. But Madam Chair, when you earlier were speaking, you said June 2026. Did you mean June 2016? 2016, yes. Sorry. 16. Yeah. JJ, did you attend the AMC meeting that they had on Zoom for forfeiture and what the law changes are and what what happened with that? Uh, I don't think so, no. Um, you should have an email in your box. You can go view it now and they'll answer a lot of your questions. There's a lot of time that was spent on this by a lot of different counties and state representatives to make sure that it was done right, that it would be beneficial and um, to the, the land owner, but also to the counties in the state. Um, you know, they followed state statute for all those years doing what needed to be done according to state statute. And the statute just is, is in the process of being changed with the new, the new laws that came through on this. But I think if you don't have that email, let me know and I'll, I'll forward you what I've got because you can watch the presentation and see what was done. Yeah, it'd be great. You can get me another copy of that. Thank you. And then with this one at the, like I said, Hennepin versus Tyler, Tyler versus Hennepin County, uh, it was over $25,000. This is just one in our county at $235,000. Um, could I get the, I mean, do you have like a list that you're working on with everybody else that is in the same similar situation as this one? And yeah, I, I had to provide that last fall oh. to the to, um, AMC because they were working on the settlement language so that they needed to understand how much the potential paybacks were going to be. So right, I so can send you that can, over. You can forward that to me so I can yep. see, especially. Thank you. And any any paybacks are administered through the state. Right, based through the on settlement, the settlement, state settlement fund. Each, each individual county will not be doing individual settlements. That was the, the purpose of having the class action lawsuit settlement, was to streamline that and put it all at one point at the state. This was, is that similar, like with the opioid class action settlement, where you had a choice to either go it alone or to go with everybody else we're, or well, this this was this was legislation that was sought by the counties and uh paul mcdonald was was uh from st louis county was kind of our area representative to that because st louis county has a tremendous amount of sales that have taken place and uh, it involves timber and mining and all kinds of stuff um, but he, he helped negotiate this, this thing on our behalf. And, and so what we were hoping for and what it appears like, uh, what I gained from district one, listening to Paul and to the MC representatives that the counties, um, uh, were seeking to be held harmless because we were following state statute. We just didn't make this up on our own. We, we followed state statute for all these years of how we disposed of these properties. And so it, it shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be the ones held liable when, when we followed state statute and then something went awry. So I, I forwarded to you that email already um, that has it where you can go watch that. And it's Paul McDonald, and it's, I can't think of her name, the zoning administrator for St. Louis. Julie. Um, 
I can't say her. Julie, Julie, to, to, so uh, yeah. it's, it's, um, Julie M. Hennepin is on there and, and Washington County are on there. Um, but it's it's a whole presentation on the law and what was changed and what the effects are and all that. So it would be a good thing for you to watch and you'll get those questions answered. Is there anything else on this? No, oh, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we are on commissioner updates. We have Kettle River. There was not a meeting, ma'am, sure. Okay. Um, NACO Telecommunication and Technology, um, I was not able to make that one, um, but they were doing the resolutions for the NACO conference next week. And then the Rural Action Caucus, um, that's actually a really cool committee because it's it's all rural people. So one of the big pushes that they're having, and I'll be honest, I wasn't aware of this, but our postal service, we're having a lot of issues with mail and I've talked to people in the auditor treasurer's office and we're getting mail like a month later. Um, people will come and check and say, why haven't you cashed my check for my taxes? I paid it. And then they'll, re, they'll redo it you know, a month later and their check comes like four or five days after that. So um, there's a resolution that's gonna be going to Congress asking that our local jurisdictions have the opportunity to work with the postal services to see if we can get it fixed. So that was a big one on that one. Um, because it's affecting so many rural counties. AMC Board of Directors meeting, um, you all got the, the highlights on that that came through. Um, the one thing I do wanna present on that is that um, there was a letter that went on there that came from Anoka County and it's to help our veterans. Right now, um, the way it is, is if a veteran passes away, it's really hard for them to get their death certificate so that they can be buried, so that they can um, file for social security or whatever they need to do to get the paperwork to do that. Um, if a doctor has not seen them within six months and we, um, we all know veterans that are having a hard time being seen by the VA um, where it's been more than six months or they switch doctors or whatever. And so there's, there's just a really big issue with that. So in that letter that came out from ANC, AMC, um, there's a sample letter in there that's going out from Anoka County. And if you can sign your names to that, I think it would be beneficial for our veterans. Um, Snake River <clears throat> Plan Watershed, we already talked about that with the motion to dissolve. Um, East Central Regional Development Commission Annual Meeting. I missed that. Okay. Pine County Housing and EDA. Yep, we had a meeting. The <clears throat> Well, as of July 1st, I think all the buildings are full, Fendelson and that was, but at the time they, they were expected to take their uh, tenancy on the first. So the hailstorm that went through damaged both the Fendelson building and the sandstone building. Fendelson had, I think, 84,000, no, no, 58,000 and um, sandstone had $80,000 worth of damage just on the size of the buildings. So that plan is in place the North Court management that we they're going to purchase that's I think is going to August 2nd was it or that's going to probably happen and then the management group that has those two buildings is going to assume management of that building with a small increase in that I mean she'll increase the cost a little bit and Leslie gave an update on housing things and policies and procedures which we did the, you know the local housing trust thing that we adopted as a board and she they're administering administering that and then we had a little moment of silence for um jan oak who served on the board for quite a few years is because she passed away so that's pretty much it but we also had uh marion rarick spoke oh yeah that's Habit right Habitat yeah, yeah. Humanity. yeah. I, Wasted no, cover that. Yes, quite all right. No, you can cover uh, it. So, yeah. yeah, they're just they're just working on some lot, purchasing some lots in uh, sandstone, and uh, they got a contractor that's working right now to get a, a slab on grade, three bedroom, two bath home, pretty much following the habitats uh, specs what they do, and uh, she just emphasized the the need for it, and uh, and then the shortage that we all know of housing in our in our county, and then. Uh, uh, we talked a little bit, we don't talk much on the e-economic development side, so we spoke a little bit on that. And uh, it's kind of nice now because the board, you know, even though we had lost a previous board member, we have two people on the board that uh, I guess fit right in really well with the economic development side with uh, 
with Traver and Rick, Traver being on the banking side and, and Rick being a, a realtor. And uh, just hopeful working with Leslie, we can get some more discussion going in on the, on the economic development side for this, for this county locally. That's all I got. And Madam Chair, if I could just add, um, Marion gave her update on Habitat. She also announced her resignation from her position as executive director. So they're actively seeking a replacement if you know anyone who would be a good fit for that position. Great. Are there any others? I, I got one other, Madam Chair. All right, go see me. I, I want to give a shout out to our, uh, our vet coordinator, Mindy, and her assistant. I, I'm, at, I'm at this marvelous facility in, in uh, Hines, Illinois, which is just outside of Chicago. Uh, it's located on a couple hundred acre campus alongside of Loyola University Medical Center. And uh, all they, this facility is a standalone facility that I'm in. Uh, and and all they do is rehabilitation for low vision and blind veterans. You have to be a veteran to get here. Mindy helped me get pointed in the right direction. Um, and it's it is quite a place. I I, um, I I needed to be here. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks to her. <laughs> yeah, You're very black. I do have one more comment. Yes, I received a couple complaints on the boat landing on Pacagama, where our we have a someone working there doing the checks. That the people is that is in bad shape. Some complaints are coming in on it. So I don't know who we reach out to. I don't know that is that a DNR? That's a DNR um, facility. So yeah. I'll, yeah, okay. Okay. So. Your new guy, could he handle that? Con Con Condiff or whatever his name is? We could reach out. Yeah, I'll reach out to somebody. All right, thank you. I have a couple others. Um, I sat in on with Tina Smith and the North Pine area. It was interesting seeing some of the things that she's gonna work with. The one that um, actually NACO has a resolution that's going to Congress on this also, where it's gonna be presented um, but right now, if we have somebody that volunteers to drive people, like if they have to go to radiation or chemo or wherever they're driving, they, I forgot to write down how much they get, but it's its minuscule to the 67 cents that everybody else gets for mileage. So they're looking at upping that so that they can get paid what they're, you know, they don't get paid for their time. They're, they're already given everything out. Um, there's some changes that are going to be coming through. There's a... Um, Population Act for volu for volunteer drivers, um, so that'll go to sixty five cents. Rural emer rural em emergency hospital program, and then Pine Tech and Hospital District Board are having meetings to educate and just the the classes that they're giving people to become CNAs and and all that type of stuff. Um, it was interesting hearing the things that Tina's working on in Washington. And then um, we talked about the AMC forfeited land. Um, if anybody else wants to get that, let me know and I'll forward you the, the live screening on that so that you can look and see what happened to that. Um, and then there was the audit entrance and everybody got an email on that also. And then um, yesterday I sat in with um, President Mary Jo McGuire and all of the other NACO pres or vice chairs and chairs to go over what's gonna be happening at the meeting next week. And um, just another FYI sitting in on the resolution, our resolution for um, Piltan Tribal Trust Land has made it through the first step. So it'll be going to the, the conference next week. So hopefully that will get approved and we'll, we'll see if we can get Good. some help with that. Good. That is my others. Anybody else have any others? Oh. We have a closed cool session coming up. Well, yeah, one, the one other I just, and thanks for the discussion on the Procagon bubble landing, because um, unless it's a typo and it was just missed, was there anything for the cost of the work to be done out on Crooked Creek? Did I miss it or it wasn't in the packet? The cost of the, and who's, 
Yeah, so Greg at the Land Department is coordinating that with Summerlin Excavating, and the cost estimate was not more than $10,000. Was that then it was put out on bids, right? Um, I don't believe that it was because it is not over the bid threshold requirement. What excavating was it? I'm sorry. Summerland excavating. Oh, he does nice. a lot of work out in that area. Nice. And then not to exceed ten thousand. Right. Okay, thank you. All right. So we have our upcoming meetings. So take a peek at what you've got coming up for the next couple of weeks. And we are going to be closing this meeting. Um pursuant to Minnesota statute 13D.05 subdivision three to conduct the annual performance evaluation of County Administrator Dave Minky. We take a two minute. So we're actually going to, yeah, because they got it, they're going to set it up so that Steve can join us online and we're going to meet in the conference room next oh, door. Perfect. Do you need a motion to close it or are you just going to close? I'll move that to close. All those in, oh, oh, roll call. <laughs> Kelly? Kelly, we're, we're not done yet. <laughs> okay, Jess is going to do a roll call. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Lovegren. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Walham. Oppose. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. This is for the closed. Aye. District 1, Commissioner Holland. Yes. Motion carried. All right, we will reconvene in just a couple of minutes in the room next door. And Steve, um, Dave is going to send you the. Yep, the yep. I got it. I got it. I tried to log into the board meeting with that. <laughs> a few minutes to get set up in there. Yep.
All right, we will reconvene this meeting. Um, Steve needed to leave, so he's not here for the end, but um, the closed meeting is for the, yeah, the closed meeting is closed. <laughs> we'll reconvene our regular meeting. Can we have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. 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 Motion by yep. Matt, second by JJ. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Show you.